and good afternoon to everyone in Europe. Um, the job I have is to set the context of the agreement, and I'm going to keep looking over my shoulder at my slide, but I have put into these slides a lot more material than I'll be able to talk about with the notion that it's going to be an archived webinar and people can go back to it. So this agreement has been dubbed by its proponents TTIP, but in fact, it's got a long history. It's an agreement with a history, and um, it has another name, which is more accurate, which is TAFTA, the Transatlantic Free Trade Agreement. So when we heard that there was going to be a US-EU agreement, a lot of us were hopeful. A lot of the European standards, actually consumer environmental standards are superior, labor standards to the US. So this was the possibility for the actual long-awaited 21st century new upward trade agreement. And it was fairly heartbreaking, therefore, when the high-level US-EU dialogue published its paper in February. And what we saw was an announcement of an, a launch of an agreement that's a lot like the old-fashioned US free trade agreement, the old NAFTA model, which we've been living with the damaging results of. So it was disappointing, but not totally shocking, because here's the context. Although we heard Taft is this new thing that's been launched and it's modern, in fact, it's been a project of a block of U.S. and European corporations that were established in the early 1990s in the form of something called the Transatlantic Business Dialogue. It has recently changed its name to Transatlantic Business Council, but it's the same gang of large U.S. and EU companies that forum was set up for them to have a special dialogue with U.S. cabinet members and European Commission um, ministers. And um, for a long time, they've had a very specific agenda. I have on the slide a list of those companies, not necessarily the friends of the environment and consumer and labor rights. So their agenda all along has been to what they call eliminate trade irritants and to facilitate their business practices. Next slide, please. So a little bit of the code word here, because up front, we have heard from the U.S. and European Union that this agreement is not going to be about traditional trade matters. The, the average tariff between the U.S. and the EU is already very low, around 3%, the border tax on traded goods. So what, what's this about? It is about behind the border regulatory issues, as Ginny said. And some code words folks need to know. What's behind the border? That is code, that is a nice euphemism for what we would otherwise know as our domestic policies that Congress, state legislators, and regulatory agencies should be making through transparent means in the US with those of us who will live at the results having input on the outcomes. What is a trade irritant? See also non-tariff barrier code NTB. This is not a cheer, this is a problem. These are things that we would otherwise in our world know as our highest environmental, food safety, worker safety standards. Some of the ones that we know are targeted because happily, the companies have been very explicit over the last 20 years listing what they think of as the irritants, AKA our strong standards that they want to eliminate. Some of those things, key parts of the US financial re-regulation, not just Dodd-Frank, but a list of other specific regulations. There are a whole set of complaints against our state-by-state -state insurance regulation system, where some states like California do very progressive, cool things, and uh, that leads the country. In the European Union, superior food standards, not allowing our foods that are slaughtered in sloppy ways and then dunked in chlorine to kill all of the critters that are remaining in the feces that we tolerate <clears throat> on our chickens, for instance, as well as artificial growth hormones and European system of segregating and labeling GMO foods. The EU chemical policy reach, you're gonna hear more details in each of these issues. The, some parts of the EU climate directive have been targeted by U.S. by U.S. Um, companies, and now NSA, <clears throat> various privacy directives, including the safe harbors policy, which in the European Union means you can't off you can't offshore data that's privacy protected unless to a safe harbor, i.e., a place with these kind of protections. And legacy issue, another code word that would be a trade irritant that has not been axed yet. Next slide. So what exactly are we really talking about? 
And this really is sort of the punchline of the entire presentation. We don't have time to go through it, but I wanted to put in the information of the issues that aren't covered in this particular seminar, but I'm sure will be covered in other teachings on this subject. Because as Ginny said, this is really a vehicle that is broad ranging and has very little to do with trade. So some of the issues that we're not going to talk about are going to be the ones I'm going to focus on. I've just summarized the first issue, the harmonization of standards. Some of the mechanisms are things like mutual recognition and free passage, where this is the goal of the European Union for financial regulations. If a company meets the financial regulations in Europe, they have to be allowed to operate here. We still would have the liability. We still would suffer the consequences if it wasn't a strong enough standard, but the companies in Europe that met their standards wouldn't have to meet our standards. This is also a goal the U.S. has with a bunch of those food safety rules. So we'd be able to import stuff that did not meet the better European standards if it met our standards. Another big set of issues we don't have time to talk about, but very important, financial rollback, as well as service sector regulation writ large, from all the environmental issues around energy and climate to issues around health care and other fundamental essential services. Under this agreement, there are a set of regulatory policies that are simply banned, even if they treat domestic and foreign companies the same. This is the model that we've seen in past U.S. free trade agreements. This is what the high-level declaration says is going to be the model. This is something we need to not have repeated. Similarly, a ban on things like capital controls or financial transaction taxes, the Robin Hood tax, it's really gained traction in the EU would be forbidden. Now, a lot of people are thinking, why is this in a trade agreement? Very good question. These are not trade issues. Then the new foreign investor privileges. You're going to hear more about that from Alana, but in sum, these are rules that give foreign corporations extensive new rights and new intellectual property rights, copyright rules that could limit internet freedom and more. Next slide, please. Um, this is what everyone thinks of as a trade agreement. I put this in there just to like, have everyone think, ah, oh, this is trade, not anymore. Next slide. That system was replaced, hit it again, by da, 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 the new modern globalization agreements of the World Trade Organization and the free trade agreements. Next slide, please. All of those other agreements are non-trade traditional matters, limiting service sector regulation, imposing new intellectual property rights, etc. Key take home. This agreement is not about trade. That's a branding stunt. It's a global system of enforceable governance. Break our hearts, the multilateral environmental agreements, the international labor organization standards, not so enforceable. This, in contrast, would be enforceable. The binding provision is countries shall ensure the conformity of their domestic policies to the agreement. That's the boilerplate from the WTO. That kind of language shows up in every US FTA. It is enforced. Governments can sue governments and put trade sanctions in place if you don't gut a law that does not meet those rules, or corporations can directly sue the governments outside our courts through investor state tribunals, the outrageous system that Ginny mentioned. This is not about trade between countries. This is diplomatic legislating by trade officials who see their constituency narrowly as U.S. companies. This is not democracy of decisions with those who will live with the results. So perhaps the most clear revelation of what this agreement, as it's currently construed, again, heartbreak could be different, is about is the fact that it has the investor state system. Now, we don't have time to go through it. I put it in the slide so that everyone could see the structure of it. The bottom line of it is, individual companies get new rights in the agreement, get elevated to the same level as a signatory nation state, individual company equal with entire nation state, to sue governments outside domestic courts to privately enforce a public treaty and new special privileges by demanding cash from us taxpayers to compensate the costs of basic environmental land use, health, labor, and other policies. Next slide. The tribunals are three private sector attorneys. They rotate between being the judges and suing governments. They can demand payment of unlimited sums of cash. 
There are no conflict of interest rules, and there are no outside appeals. Next slide. The system of these attacks has gone through the ceiling. Everything you can imagine has been attacked, from tobacco controls to mining policy, from water policy to labor rights. Next slide. 15 of these individuals rotating as judges and litigators now have 55% of the cases. This is a disaster. Next slide. Why would this possibly be in a US-EU trade agreement? It was supposed to be for developing countries that did not have functioning courts. I beg the question, is it the US or the EU who has crappy property rights laws and dysfunctional courts? Neither, thus revealing that the corporate agenda. I threw in the slide because people say, this is not believable, except this is just a smorgasbord of a few of the cases that have actually had corporations paid out or laws sacked. Next slide. So summing up, who writes the rules, rules. So we all need to get involved because right now 600 corporate advisors have direct access. The plan is not to have this negotiation have access for most of us to the actual text. Congress, if fast-track trade authority is allowed again, perhaps it won't be, would be sidelined. And then we have basically U.S. and EU corporate demands masquerading as a trade agreement being implemented around normal process. Final slide. Why would this be done? I'm just going to leave this for people to ponder as I exit. The claim is that we're going to get great growth and efficiency gains. And in fact, this is something that has never been proved. This is premised on the notion that deregulation creates gain somehow. This is a myth, and in fact, the empirical studies on this kind of convergence of regulations in the EU do not show the efficiency gains and growth that's being promised. And in fact, the two main studies, one that's being worked on, the US one, and the major EU one, which I take down here, have incredible flaws in their design. There's simply no basis for the claim that there are gains, yet we know what the downsides are. So why now? Because the big companies hope Europe is so desperate for any growth that they'll cave in all their superior standards, which would be a ceiling on progress for us in the future and a rollback for them that's simply not tolerable. On the back table, letters from US and EU organizations to the heads of state at the launch of this negotiation, laying out the other vision of what it should be and what's not acceptable. The transatlantic consumer dialogue, all the US and EU consumer groups laying out the agenda. And for the wonks, our copy, a copy of our comments to the record. Thank you very much.